Hey everyone and welcome back. So in this video we will be creating our obstacle blueprints and we will be adding some basic interaction with them. So to begin if we go to our blueprints folder as we've done before we're going to go to the blueprint classes and under here this time we actually want to create an actor class. So actors are basically anything which can be placed in the world so most things like these cubes cameras and anything that we've really seen like this before that we've used or interacted with in the main map are a type of actor so this would be like a static mesh actor other things would be called camera actors which basically mean they are of the actor class and they just have an extra component added onto them such as the static mesh or the camera so we're going to create an empty actor so this will have nothing in it apart from the transform which can be added to the world this one we'll call bp underscore obstacle and with that done, we're just going to double click to open this and we can start editing our obstacles. Now, kind of like we did with the pawn, all I'll do in this one is I will add a component and that will be the cube. Like we did with the player, all we'll be doing for this one is adding a component and that will be the cube. And we will replace the cube with the default scene root. If you wanted to, you can F2 to rename the cube and we'll just call this obstacle. Okay, so this is now ready to go again. And we won't actually be putting any logic into the obstacle in this series everything's going to be run inside of the player blueprint what we probably want to start doing though is adding some of the visual details as we go through so that we can start differentiating things in the world i'm going to control w the mi underscore flat white which will give us a new material i'm just going to call this one flat red and i'll do the same thing and i'll call this one flat blue now I'm not the most design oriented person, so I am a programmer at heart. My art style is wanting. So what I'm gonna do is we'll open these and I'm actually gonna use some predefined color palettes. And I've been finding this really useful when I'm even just prototyping things, like we'll be having a very basic looking project. If I was to choose the colors, it would look even worse than the basic prototype assets should. So what I found really useful and the website I have up at the moment is just one of the many options, uh, is colorhex.com. You can look for things like, at the moment, I like the kind of flat or pastel type color schemes that people come up with. So I wouldn't be able to pick the colors which merge together quite as well as they have here. So what I've been doing is, let's say we want our red color. I'm going to grab this hex value. And inside of the red material, I'm going to come to the color picker and I'll just paste this in. And now I have what I know will be a fairly decent shade of red. Likewise, I'll come back and I think this dark blue is going to go best with it or gray or whatever this is. I'm going to call it blue. And then again, I'll come back and I'll go to our color picker and I'll put the hex value in there. So now I have two colors, which I know I will be using as the, the background color and the color for the player. And I know that when they're next to each other, they're not going to clash. It just makes prototyping things a little bit faster so I don't need to play about with colors so much. And because I'm not great at it anyway, um, I start to get a sense of the colors as I go through. And most importantly, it doesn't make what could be a potentially good project look terrible due to just bad general art choices. So that is the logic I'm taking here. I'm gonna go back to the player and in fact, I'll give this the red material now. So we'll go back and give that the red color. And likewise, if we go into the obstacles, I'll make the obstacle that we have the darker blue color and that should be everything we want for the visuals at the moment. Now, the only other thing is whilst we're doing the visual stuff, there's something I want to turn off in the project settings, and that is the auto exposure. So if we type in auto exposure, we can see that that is automatically enabled. I'm just going to disable that. And that just means that when we hit play, uh, there won't be any color changes or anything being adjusted to match the eye when you get that kind of shot of light. It just means that we will get a more standardized result when we go into play mode as we see when we're setting up the world here. Now, the other things I want to do is I'm going to go in to the world outliner and remove the atmospheric fog and the skylight. And the reason I do that is we actually want the skylight, but the one that's provided doesn't seem to do anything. If we drag this in now, we can see we get a slightly highlighted color on the path. And we're gonna be replacing the fog a little bit later, but that will come as the arty thing. And we can now see the colors updated on the floor a bit better. It's not that horrible beige color that was there. Okay, so we've done the art stuff. Now we're gonna go back to the player. So that was the main thing here, is we're going to go into the player blueprint. And what we want is to select the player object. We're gonna go down to the details panel. And on the right hand side, we want to get an on component hit event. So this is going to be when something hits the player, we want this to do something. Now, first of all, to get this to actually work, we want to scroll back up to the collision section just here. And we want to tick the simulate generate hit events. 
So we have a few different types of events that we can get inside of the engine. At the moment, we have the collision set as a physics actor, which is fine because it needs to simulate physics. But if we drop that down, we have three different options. We have ignore, overlap, and block. Now, ignore will obviously not interact with anything else. We currently have this to block, which means that we have a kind of physical object. We will, in ourselves, be a surface and collide with surfaces. If you want to know when a surface hits or blocks another surface, then you need the generate hit event to be enabled. What we'll be adding later is a checkpoint to act as the win state, and that's going to be an overlap. So we don't want it to physically hit the checkpoint. If you imagine how you would set up a racing game, uh, you don't want the checkpoints to be walls. You want them to just to know that the cars went through a checkpoint. So that will be an overlap event. And if you want overlap events, then you'd need to change the objects to overlap something. And you need to make sure that the generate overlap events is also enabled. The main thing here is that we set the generate hit events to be active. And what we want to do is on this hit event that we've just created, we want to check what the other actor is. So to do this, we will pull off of the other actor, so the other thing that we've hit. And with that done, we will cast to, which means find out what the other object is. So cast to, and we want to cast to the blueprint we've just made, which is the BP underscore obstacle. So select the cast to BP underscore obstacle. That will automatically link the execution pin over here. And this is essentially saying whether we've succeeded or failed. Now, if we failed, that means that we've hit something that isn't an obstacle, in which case we wouldn't be interested. Uh, that would be something like when you first land on the floor, you're going to be hitting the floor. So we don't want to end the game because of that. But what we want to know is that when we've hit the obstacle, we want to do something. And what we can do is we can print an update to the screen. And we do that with a print string. So type print string, and we will just say hit. So when we hit an obstacle, if the thing that we've hit is in fact the, the other actor is in fact of type blueprint obstacle, then we will see the word hit appear on the screen. And obviously to get this to work, we need to drag in some obstacles. So we'll just make sure that we can hit this one. We'll make it nice and wide. And when you have this above a surface that you want it to collide with, just hit the end key and that will snap it down to the floor. And now if we press play, we can see that in the distance, possibly too distant. And in the top left hand screen, you want to look for the word hit has just appeared or is appearing. So that means that this is being called and that is working perfectly fine. And that is indeed that type of obstacle. Just to check the other option is when we first hit the floor, we'll now see that we're hitting the floor because we're checking for anything which isn't an obstacle as well. So we don't want to do the cast failed. OK, so that is the simple way to see that something's happening. Now, what we want to do, obviously, we want to do things like bring up a game over menu, which we don't have yet. We want to stop the player's movement. We want to change the state of the game entirely, really, when an obstacle is hit. So we're going to make a placeholder function. And the function is basically a encapsulation of logic for, for the game or for the class that we're in. So if we come over to the left hand side, we can see we have our functions here and we want to create a new one. And I'm just going to call this game ended. So when the game has ended, we want to call this function. Now, there's really not very much that we can do in here at the moment. I know that I'm going to want a Boolean to be toggled. So we can create this Boolean and we'll call this B. And this is a lowercase b for Boolean and then game ended. So this is just going to be keeping track of whether or not we're in a state where the game has been ended. So the first thing we want to do when we hit the game ended function is we're going to do a branch. Now, a branch is a check. If you're familiar with scripted programming, then an equivalent, for example, in C sharp, this would be an if statement. And we want to check whether or not the game has already ended. So if the game has been updated somewhere else, such as the success state, then we want to make sure that we're not doing the same thing twice. So we want to check whether or not the game hasn't ended. And to do this, we're going to pull off of the game ended we have here and do a not Boolean check. So we're going to find out whether this isn't already set to be true. And that's another thing. In fact, if we come back in and hit compile so that we can see the update here, we want to make sure that this starts off as false. We don't want to start the game in an ended state. And then if this hasn't already ended, so remember this is the not Boolean check, we're going to drag off of here and we will set game ended. So just type set game and we see the option down here, game ended. And you'll also notice in Unreal, although we've prefixed this with a lowercase b so that we know it's a Boolean, the Unreal Engine's aware of this kind of syntax and it's removed it. So when we actually see the name of the variable, we just see it as the, the name we wanted it to have, the Boolean it represents. So we're going to set this. So we're going to change its Boolean variable to be true from false. So we now know the game has indeed ended. And we're going to have some logic here, which again is not really going to be readily available to us. And we're going to want to define this in the game mode. But as we're not doing any of this yet, we're just going to create a heads up like a, a temporary marker 
So we're going to take the print string from the event graph. We're going to place this into the function. And we're just going to change the uh, the string to say something like hit end game, so that we now know that we're going to make these changes. But we also need to come back and update this function when we have more things. So when we have the end screen ready and everything else, we're going to come back and we'll make these changes. Now, obviously, uh, because I've removed the print string, we want to go back to the event graph. When this happens, we want to actually call our game ended function. So we'll type game ended as I forgot to do that. So make sure that you actually call the functions of that you've just made. And then we'll go back over again, we'll hit play. And I really need to bring the obstacle a little bit closer. But we will hit play and we'll nicely that we have that new print string hit game ended. So we want to make sure that that's just going to stay there until we've implemented this and come back and actually flash out this, uh, this function to do the correct thing. But until we have everything ready, the end game states and stuff don't really matter. What we could do, though, is now that we have our Boolean check, in fact, we can come back to our movement. So for example, we probably don't want this to keep moving. You'll see that when we hit the thing, it's going to keep calling that print string because it keeps calling that function because there's a small amount of movement still happening when the cube is running into the obstacle. So what we can do is in between our add impulse, we're going to use another branch and we will check whether or not the game has not ended. So again, we're going to get the game ended. We're going to get a not Boolean and we're going to make sure that the game has not ended. So if the game hasn't ended, if that's true, then we're obviously still playing the game, then we want the player to move. If that's false, then this is no longer going to be called. We just we have nothing happening when that's the case. And likewise, we're actually just going to control W all of this and we'll move this down to the input function as well. So we don't want the player to start uh, moving sideways when they've hit an object. We don't want them to be able to get around it. Once they've hit that object, they've lost. So if we come back in now, we're going to see this happen. We're going to see the movement will be taken away from the player as soon as this has been hit. So the forward force has stopped. We've bounced away from the obstacle and I've now lost control of the cube. So we can see that this not Boolean check has been successful. We can see that we're now in a state where the game is over. OK, so if that done, the obstacles and the obstacle collision is set ready to go for further implementation when we add the new parts of the game the ui and things like that so i'll leave this one here again for today as always though if you've enjoyed the video or found it useful then don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with the latest content from the channel a like and a share of the video is always appreciated as ever though thanks for watching and i will see you all next time